I'm Anna Bradley and I'm the chair of the SRA and I'm delighted to be speaking to you here from our 2023 compliance conference in Birmingham. It's uh, fantastic that we've got around 900 solicitors uh, here today to hear directly from us, ask their questions uh, and uh, hopefully walk away with some answers to their compliance uh, issues. We've already had some great conversations about anti-money laundering, about client protection, uh, about AI and the use of tech uh, to deliver more and better access to justice. Um, uh, but we have much more to come during the course of the day. And I'm delighted to be able to say that because I know so many of you really value being able to engage with uh, this conference virtually uh, and at the same time also have the opportunity to ask questions of uh, the expert panels that we've drawn together for this event in Birmingham. We will be repeating uh, 11 of the sessions over uh, the next uh, short period. And we will give you that opportunity not just to watch, but also to interact uh, and ask your own questions. The first of those virtual sessions will be on anti-money laundering. I encourage you to join that one and I hope many of the others uh, enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Virtual Compliance Officers Conference. So welcome to this session on anti-money laundering, what your firm needs to know. Now, the way this is going to work is that we're going to see a recording of the presentation from our session at the Compliance Conference Confer uh, Compliance Officers Conference, which took place a couple of weeks ago in Birmingham. Um, but we do want this session to be as interactive as possible. So what we're going to do is after the recording of the session, we'll have up to about half an hour for live Q&A with myself and our panellists. So I'm here, Colette Best, Director of Anti-Money Laundering at the SRA, and I'm joined by colleagues Manip Sandhu, Head of AML Proactive Supervision at the SRA, and also Michael Lane, who's Managing Partner at Gisby Harrison. So we're here to answer all of your questions. So what you need to do to ask a question uh, is to just click on the link below this, this broadcast and submit your questions. You can do that anonymously if you prefer, but it's always nice to uh, know your name if you're happy to submit it with your name. So we'll look forward to taking your questions in about half an hour, but first let's play the recording. And thank you all so much for choosing to attend this anti-money laundering session uh, and indeed the conference today. So I've got around 15 minutes or so to cover the headlines, so what firms are doing well, but also where firms are still continuing to struggle and where we're looking for room for improvement. And then what I'll be doing is just expanding a little bit on what Paul introduced this morning, which is the recent thematic review that we've done into client to matter risk assessments, um, and also the warning notice that we've published this morning. Um, I'm going to take this moment actually to trail the fact that we're also doing a lunchtime slot out in the exhibition on client to matter risk assessments. So if you want a bit more of a practical uh, insight into how to do those, we're going to be covering that off at lunchtime. So, I have, perfect. All right, so let me just take a moment to talk about how we supervise anti-money laundering, because I know this is a question that, that comes up quite often. So essentially, we've got a threefold approach here. So firstly is provision and sharing of information. Um, so that is firstly around providing guidance to the profession, and that is our sort of our preferred methodology. You know, we really, really, where possible, want to help you to comply and to help firms comply. So there's a wealth of information out there. Um, we also share information with other supervisors to help our work. So that can be on a trend basis, but also on an individual basis if uh, we're sharing information about firm that others supervise. Secondly, we take, uh, undertake proactive supervision to actually go out and check firm's compliance with the regulations. And I'm joined by my colleague Mandeep, who heads up our proactive supervision function. 
Um, and proactive supervision can be one of, one of several things. So um, we do desk-based reviews. Uh, we do thematic reviews, which, of course, I'm going to talk about in a moment. But we also go out and do on-site inspections. And all of those will involve um, a, a degree of checking your firm's policies, procedures, controls, your documents in place. But also, most importantly, doing reviews of files to check that actually this policy has been put in place in practice. Um, so in the last year, and this is the reporting year, we report on the financial year, April to April, uh, we had 273 proactive engagements with firms, and the breakdown of those was uh, 136 as part of our rolling programme of inspections. We did 15 as part of an on-site inspection, 73 desk-based reviews, 26 thematic inspections, and we did uh, 12 thematic, um, we, sorry, we did 12 uh, as part of a screening exercise into financial sanctions. So the important thing to note is that actually these are increasing year on year. So the number of engagements that we're proactively doing with firms are going up. So your chances of being selected uh, is increasing year on year. And if you get the letter, we're going to be asking for your policies, controls, procedures as of that date. So if you wait to review your policies until we write to you, that, that's too late. The time to get your ducks in a row is now. Um, so, uh, Michael uh, is going to be joining us uh, to speak about his experiences of being uh, subject to an inspection in just a moment. And then the third uh, pillar of our approach is enforcement action. And these come from a range of sources. Uh, so we do, we do still get self-reports. As I said, we, we liaise with other agencies, so we get reports in for other agencies. Um, historically, that has been the National Crime Agency, law enforcement, other supervisors. Increasingly this year, interestingly, we're getting reports in about potential sanctions breaches from the Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation. Um, we've got a small cohort of cases now that we're looking at potential sanctions breaches. But actually, the biggest source now of our investigations is the work that we're driving ourselves through proactive supervision. So when we're going out, we're doing inspections, we are hoping to bring firms back into compliance. But if we're seeing things that are either really serious or systematic, we are passing those over for investigation uh, and potentially enforcement. And as you can see, in the last year, we've undertaken just under 40 uh, enforcement outcomes. Um, and the other thing that I've, I've flagged for myself to say is uh, that all of these figures, and in fact all of the stuff that I'm covering in this presentation today, is covered in our annual report, which we published on Friday. So some of this stuff I'll, I'll skip back, skip through quite quickly, um, but do have a read of the annual report because it does go into it in a bit more detail. So let me talk first about key anti-money laundering controls and what we found through our work in the, the last year. So what we've got really is, is a life cycle of controls, and these form the bedrock of your, your uh, firm's prevention against money laundering. So we start with the firm-wide risk assessment. So this is the backbone of your anti-money laundering controls. And if you don't get this right, it's really hard to get everything else right because everything hangs off the back of that. So it's really important that you take the time to, to get your firm-wide risk assessment right. One thing to flag is that uh, reasonably recently we've had a new requirement for that also to, to include uh, a proliferation financing risk assessment. That can be either part of your firm-wide risk assessment or it can be a separate document entirely, but it does need to be assessed somewhere in writing because we will be looking for it when we come out and, uh, and inspect your firm. So in terms of firm-wide risk assessments, as I said, really, really key part of controls. I think the figure that's quite striking for me is that from our uh, inspections, desk-based reviews, proactive engagements in the last year, we only found 47% of them to be fully compliant. So this is something where there is still, still room for improvement. So you've got your firm-wide risk assessment. So what then hangs off that is your policies, procedures, and controls. And this is really important because it sets out, okay, here's the risk, but this is what we're doing as a firm to prevent money laundering. So, you know, what, what's our position on reliance? What is uh, the red flags that we need to look at? 
if we're seeing suspicion, how do you report it internally? How do you uh, report it externally? So really, really crucial part of your controls. And again, in the last year, we found 51% of them to be generally compliant, 28% to be partially compliant. And then moving on from policies, procedures, and controls, those should then feed into your client and matter risk assessment, which is, as I say, a big, big theme for today. We're going to be talking about that a lot more. Um, but this is when we're doing file reviews, oftentimes, to be honest, where the wheels come off. So we see really great documents up to this point, but actually at client and matter level, that's where the gaps begin to appear. Um, and we often see, and this is a bit of a theme for uh, sort of my presentations today, actually, where firms have got really good processes in place in theory, but they're not actually used in practice. Um, so I'll come on to this in a bit more detail, but uh, in general, we found that 51% of client matter risk assessments were ineffective. And then finally, uh, your uh, client and master risk assessments feed into your customer due diligence. So having assessed the risk that the client poses, you're then going out, you're taking steps to mitigate that risk through gathering information about their identity, understanding the transaction, understanding where their funds come from. Um, and I think something to say is where we bring enforcement cases, Oftentimes, this is where they come from. It's because the client due diligence, the CDD, hasn't been undertaken properly. Um, so we um, have been seeing, as I say, a lot, of, a lot of really good, really good practice in customer due diligence, um, but actually some gaps still there. And then finally, to complete that, that cycle, we see good firms looking at what they're seeing at customer due diligence matter level and then feeding that back into their, um, their firm-wide risk assessment. So moving on, um, let me just talk for a moment about some areas of good and poor practice in each of these areas. Um, as I said, there's, there's quite a lot going on in these slides. I'm not going to speak to all of these points, but all of this is contained in our annual report, which again, encourage you to read. Um, Firm-wide risk assessments, really important. Um, let me start by talking about templates, because this is a common question that we get. Templates are, are a funny beast. We see a lot of firm-wide risk assessments based on templates. And funnily, some of the best and some of the worst are on templates. The really good ones are where firms have taken a template as a starting point and adapted it to their firm and put it in the context of, of their business. The bad ones, are where we, we just see standard templates that basically haven't been adapted at all. Um, it's not that often we still say, see kind of insert firm name here, insert client base here in, in square brackets, but it does still happen. Um, and we do, you know, we see a lot of these each year. We recognize the standard text. We do see, uh, we, we do recognize where firms haven't adapted them at all. Another really key difference that we've seen between good and poor uh, firm-wide risk assessments is actually the extent to which the, the person writing it has gone out and engaged with all the teams. So where we've seen really good practice, it's evident that the person who's writing it has been out, they've spoken to all of their different teams, they've engaged with the different practice areas, they've really considered what are the areas of risks in the different areas of the business. Poor ones, um, we often see where um, firms haven't covered all of their areas of business. So it's a question for you um, if you've got areas of work that, that is outside of scope of the money laundering regulations. You don't have to include that in your firm-wide risk assessment. But actually, if you think there is a risk of money laundering coming from areas that, that aren't strictly speaking in scope of the money laundering regulations, it's a good idea to, to think about that too. Um, and I will say another tip is, is do make sure that you are covering all your work within scope, within your firm-wide risk assessment. If we're going out, if we're doing an inspection, we're doing a desk-based review, we will look at our records, we will look at your firm website to see, you know, these are the areas of service. We'll be then looking at your documents to see are those covered sufficiently. And then finally, this, this is another theme again through, through all of this, is keeping your firm-wide risk assessment under review is really important. So as you know, we at the SRA publish our own sectoral risk assessment, setting out the risks that, that we see of money laundering. We review that every quarter. 
Um, we don't update it that frequently, but we do dust it off and, and take a look and make sure that it's, it's still relevant every quarter. So make sure that you've got both proactive and reactive reviews of not just your firm-wide risk assessment, but all your documents in place. So that could be, you know, we're going to have a diary import a reminder annually to do a document review. But also, if any of these events happen, we're going to reactively review. So that could be things like we've taken on new areas of business. You know, the SRA has put out some new guidance. There's been a legislative change. We've changed our controls. Um, all of those really important triggers for, for checking that your documents are still relevant. Um, final point to mention on firm-wide risk assessments. You might have seen that we've recently uh, updated our guidance in this area. So there's absolutely masses of guidance on how to produce a firm-wide risk assessment, which we published at this conference back in 2019. So there's uh, a checklist, there's guidance, uh, there's a, a template. Um, so th there's a really, uh, a really good suite of information to help you with this. Um, a few weeks back, we, we, we haven't changed it substantially, but we've just updated it for some of the new things that we're seeing. So it includes information about um, proliferation financing, um, AI, I think crypto is in there as well. So that, that slightly updated guidance is out there. So policies, procedures and controls. So we see a lot of really good policies, procedures, and controls. Um, we see some, some poor ones as well. Um, and I think, again, the point about regular review stands for, for policies, procedures, and controls as well. Um, oftentimes, when we see failings with these, it's because they haven't, they haven't been updated because something's changed. Um, so I think the other really important thing to mention about policies, procedures, and controls is that they should be a living staff document. It should be something that people refer to regularly. So making sure that they're saved somewhere centrally, that people know where they are, that people know who to go to ask questions about them, um, that they're somewhere that, that fee earners can access is really important. And actually, we've seen some quite nice training which actually takes the, the policies, procedures, and controls as a bedrock for that training and then builds different layers of training on, on each of those aspects of it. Where we see issues in this area, it, it's normally really easily fixed. Um, taking aside the point about review, it's typically, be typically because something has been left off that is required to be in there. So oftentimes that is um, discrepancy reporting, how you, you go about doing that, um, reliance, simplified due diligence, uh, in additional measures that your firm requires for transactions that, favor an, uh, that can favor an anonymity. Um, so some of these are, are really simple to put right, and I think most firms actually don't use simplified due diligence, they don't use reliance. So it is simply just a line in your policies, procedures, and controls saying we, we don't permit reliance. So I'm going to move on next to customer due diligence. Um, I'm saving client and matter risk assessments for the last, I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, so a few more pointers on customer due diligence. Um, Again, we've seen a lot of really good practice uh, in this area. A lot of firms are taking this really seriously and getting it right. Where we've seen issues, oftentimes, as I've said, it's because firms got really good policies, procedures, controls. You look at the file, it's not being put in place in practice. Um, so making sure that actually your, your good controls, your good policies are being fed through in practice. And actually there's some audit to make sure that that, that is taking in place. Something else we see is either where the, the, the policy procedure controls have been practiced, but elements have haven't been picked up. So an example of this might be your firm wide risk assessment says conveyancing is really high risk for us. Your policies, procedures, and controls say conveyancing is really high risk for us, use enhanced due diligence, and then customer due diligence is done on a, a standard basis. So making sure that you're feeding through from your other documents into what you're doing in practice is really important. And if you choose to depart from your firm-wide risk assessment, that, that for good reasons, that's absolutely fine, but that needs to be documented and set out. One other point to pick up uh, is um, firms that have failed to do customer due diligence because they haven't picked up that the work is in scope for the money laundering regulations. 
So it's a choice for you if you've got areas of work that are outside of scope of the money laundering regulations as well as bits that are in as to whether you want to apply the same customer due diligence standards across the board. If you choose not to do that, you need to make sure that you've got really robust processes to prevent passporting. So someone coming in through, say, an employment team, standard employment advice, but then being asked out to, to provide a bit of tax advice that then brings the work inside scope and then engages all of the customer due diligence requirements. And final point on customer due diligence is making sure that the documents are available for those working on the matter. So this is probably a point potentially a bit more relevant to bigger firms, but where you've got a large team of fee earners working on a matter, making sure that all of them have got the documents, all of them have got access to it, and that will enable them to, to look out for suspicious activity. So finally, on to client and matter risk assessment. So uh, as I say, we, we've just completed the thematic review into this area. Uh, and that's primarily because, because we've got concerns about repeated non-compliance with um, client and matter risk assessments. So what we found is that majority of firms that we, we went and saw have got processes in place. So 94% of firms had a good process in place. Um, but um, nearly half of files we, we, we didn't see a client to matter risk assessment on. In part, that was because uh, the, the matter was too early in the stage and that hadn't been done yet. Um, but we did find significant concerns with, with some of the firms that we went out to review. A couple of other key findings were 27% um, of the, uh, the risk assessments we reviewed didn't reflect the firm's firm-wide risk assessment at this point that I've just been talking about. 43% um, didn't clearly show an enhanced due diligence was necessary, which is, of course, a, a really important trigger and something that people uh, absolutely need to be aware of. Um, and we found 51% of client and matter risk assessments during our file reviews were, were ineffective. And this was across the board uh, in the last year, not just as part of our thematic. We also found um, that some fee earners were, were sort of doing their own uh, client and matter risk assessments. They weren't following the firm's processes. They were doing it in their own way that hadn't been approved. And actually that, that typically led to, to quite poor outcomes. So what have we done? So this morning we've just published a suite of documents in this area. Um, all of these are available on the website that were published this morning. So we've published a warning notice setting out what poor practice we've seen um, and saying essentially this is, this is what we expect to see in this area. Um, we've sent, published a report which uh, you can use to either review your client and matter risk assessments or put in place a new template. And on that point, we've published our own template client to matter risk assessment in the same way that we've published a template firm-wide risk assessment, uh, which you can use. Absolutely no compulsion to use this if you've got your own template, which you're absolutely happy with. No need to, to depart from what's working for you. But if you do want to use our template, it's available for download. It's there to be helpful. If you're using it, make sure you're adapting it to your firm. Um, and then the final point to, to just mention again is that colleagues who led this thematic review are doing a specific lunchtime session uh, on this topic uh, in the marketplace. So do, do join that. So finally, before I hand over, um, just a couple of points of good and poor practice that we've seen in this area. So much of this is exactly the same themes that I've, I've just been, been talking about. So tailoring the document to your firm really makes the difference between a good and a poor firm-wide risk assessment. Standard texts, standard templates, generally we found lead to, to poor outcomes. Really well adapted templates that have been thought through, that have been adapted to the business, adapted to fear, and is adapted to your way of working. You know, that, that is what we're seeing is, is really working and is then leading to, to the good outcomes that you want. So appropriate levels of customer due diligence being done to, to mitigate the risk. Um, 
The other point that we saw, which actually I've, I've already mentioned briefly, is um, an area of poor practice where for, um, client to matter risk assessments didn't automatically flag up checks that need to happen. So uh, if you can make life easier for yourself by having a template or a matter risk assessment that flags up, you know, when enhanced due diligence is, is needed, if you're dealing with a PEP and you need sign off, if you're dealing with high risk uh, countries here and you need to do that, that enhanced due diligence, that's something that, that is really going to make life a lot easier for you. Um, and then the final point I'll make is we saw a bit of poor practice about um, the client matter risk assessment not being done in a timely matter, manner. So the client matter risk assessment is your, your first stage in beginning to do customer due diligence. We've seen instances where neither of those were done prior to the firm accepting funds into the, the client account, which is a massive risk factor and something that, that really you want to avoid being in that situation. And so I think we can get into this in a bit more detail uh, in the Q&A session uh, in a moment. It's great to hear that, that there were sort of lots of questions that came up in the, uh, the, the opening session that we didn't get round to. Um, but first, I'm going to hand over to Michael to talk about how he got on with a recent uh, SRA AML inspection. Good morning. I think I need to say at the outset that whilst it was very nice to be introduced as part of an expert panel on money laundering, I think I need to say that I probably know, don't know the intricacies of money laundering regulations any better than others in the room. You are all compliance officers like I am. Uh, nor would I presume to tell you how to run your practices. I'm sure you're very competent at doing that and uh, every practice is different. But I am the managing partner of a firm that has recently experienced the on-site anti-money laundering audit, and I'm here to share that experience. And I hope provide some reassurance that providing you take it seriously and providing you treat it with respect and you're doing what you think you ought to be doing, then actually there isn't a great deal to worry about. It's a very positive experience. Just to put things into context, my firm is a medium-sized general practice that's grown from its high street roots over the years. We now have 22 fee earners, all based effectively on one site, carrying out the types of work that you would expect a medium-sized firm to offer. Approximately 50% of our work is within scope of the money laundering regulations. That's commercial, residential property, com uh, trusts and company work and approximately 50% is technically out of scope, so litigation, matrimonial and employment law. But the approach we've taken and the approach I think works best for us is that we treat everything as being in scope. It enables us to standardise practices and involve everybody across the practice. It stops people having to worry about whether things need to be done or not be done. They just follow the standard practices. And we're a traditional owner-managed practice, so we're not large enough to employ teams of compliance staff, and we have to embed our systems across the board on a day-to-day -day basis. And I suspect, like many of you here today, we spend a great deal of time worrying about whether we're doing enough to comply with the money laundering regulations and whether we've got it right. But having survived the process, I can tell you that it will inevitably cause some anxiety, but it was actually a very positive experience and, and one that, I'm not going to say a pleasure, but, but certainly one that we learned a great deal from. The, the good news for everybody here, the first piece of good news for you, is of course that you now know that you are very likely to be the subject of an AML audit at some time in the future and that the SRA will be knocking on your door. The reality, of course, is that everybody complies to different levels and I think we all worry that everybody else is 100% compliant and that perhaps we're not but I know the SRE team here today will confirm that in fact compliance levels do vary but what they're really looking for I think is to know that obligations are recognised taken seriously and where there are gaps not that they're covered up but that they're recognised and that improvements will be made. Clearly knowing that there is a pending audit is a great opportunity. It's an opportunity to review where you are at the moment, and at the moment you do have the luxury 
of having some time to get ready for it. My personal view is that the most important aspect of compliance has to be the culture of the firm. You have to start with the partners, you have to start with the leadership team and make sure that they are on board with the importance of money laundering. Clearly, there's a legal imperative for complying with the regulations. It's not going away. And in 2007, we've all been told that there's 10 years in prison for anyone who commits money laundering offences, and that should be incentive enough. However, the reality is there's also clearly a moral imperative if you need to sell it to your partners. I think everybody would accept nowadays that uh, facilitating tax evasion is not a good thing. Um, we all have to fund hospitals, we all have to fund the police force, we all have to fund society generally. And clearly we don't want to be um, uh, implicit in uh, organised crime, terrorism, drug offences and the like. So getting your partnership, your leadership team on board really ought not to be a problem, but it's something, if it is, you need to address and address fairly quickly now. Changing culture inevitably takes time if it needs to be done, so I would say start working on it. And part of that change in culture, I think, is the importance of training all your staff so that they all know what's expected of them. And I think, importantly, making life as easy as possible for your staff by setting up the right processes, making sure the forms are there for them to complete. And I think the most important part of a compliance officer's role is to be there to lend a hand to answer questions, to deal with clients who may have to be asked difficult questions and perhaps quite invasive questions. But if you can do that as a compliance officer, you'll make things a lot easier for your staff and money laundering, I think, ceases to be a problem. When you receive the notice, and I still remember when that email arrived saying, we're coming along, the good news is you will get plenty of time. I think anything between one and three months warning and a date can be fixed generally at your convenience for the visit. In advance, you will have that two or three months to carry out your final preparations because you will be asked to provide copies of documents and records in advance, including details of this in-scope work that you carry out, matters lists and, or file lists, um, including, incidentally, all files that have been closed in the preceding three months. The SOA are perhaps not as stupid as all that. But when you're going through these documents and you're providing them, don't worry if they're not perfect. Nobody is. Don't cover up. It's always the cover up that's the problem. Be open, explain what you do, recognise, I would say, any gaps, because everybody will have gaps, and decide how you are best to address them. The day of the audit, it's a little bit like sitting an exam. You know, the examiner's coming, you know questions are going to be asked. And inevitably, a certain amount of anxiety is going to be induced. However, it was more of a discussion, and it, it wasn't an unpleasant day. Uh, the, uh, the individual that turned up ran through our documents one by one, asked me questions about how we would approach things, how we dealt with things, how we might deal with individual circumstances. But it was a very useful day, genuinely. It was an opportunity for me to ask questions. It was an opportunity for me to say, I'm not sure whether we do this right, I'm not sure how we encourage people to do that, and to get some one-to-one -one guidance as to how we could improve our systems. Bear in mind that a selection of your staff will also need to be available and that will be arranged in advance to uh, discuss their understanding of what they're required to do. Um, and that really comes back to the culture of the practice and why you have to make sure that everybody is doing things because otherwise you're expecting your, too much of your staff on the day. They won't be asked technical questions, but they will be asked to talk about their day-to-day -day activities and their general attitude to money laundering and the attitude of the firm to money laundering. So, if that's something which isn't embedded in your staff now, I would suggest it's something which you need to go back and start encouraging people to engage with. After the audit, obviously, one assumes that it, by being here, you're not going to be in the group of people who simply ignores compliance, doesn't think it's important, and has no processes and procedures in place when I suspect other sanctions are likely to apply. But for people that are here today and for the majority of firms, you expect to receive an outcome letter explaining in some detail 
where, you've, where you're doing things right, where you're doing things wrong, where you can improve and giving timescales for that improvement. And it is a guidance letter in most cases, um, which again, I found very useful. And so it genuinely left us ultimately after the audit process with improved processes and increased confidence that we're now doing things right. So I know that whenever one hears that an auditor is likely to come in and one is going to be, have one's work examined and one's processes looked at, it can be an anxious time, it can be a worrying time. You have plenty of time to get things right. Don't worry too much about it and genuinely engage with the process. It will improve things for you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So we've got about 15 minutes for some Q&A. Uh, so to make life easy, I'm going to just pose a pre-submitted question to the panel first. So I'm going to put this first question to Mandeep. And Mandeep, should we always sanction check another firm's clients? Yeah, thanks, Simon. So we raise sanctions um, counterparty risk in our guidance as one of the key risks. And the reason for that was because you, you can't provide benefit financial benefit to a designated person. And the key difference between the AML regime and sanctions is that sanctions has a strict liability um, offence, whereas money laundering um, is a risk-based approach. And on top of that, um, you can't uh, use reliance with the sanctions regime, so you can't rely on the fact that another firm might have carried those checks out. Um, but OFSI have issued guidance on counterparty risk um, and I would encourage you to read um, that and some of the things they've said is they won't comment on due diligence checks um, but they will look at the types of checks you've carried out and whether they were proportionate to the degree of sanctions risk. Um, but what they did also set out is that they would expect to see that decision making documented when they are looking at um, their attitude to enforcement. Okay, thank you, Mandeep. And maybe one for you, Michael. Um, what advice would you give for making sure everyone at all levels understands the importance of preventing money laundering? I think there's a number of things you have to do within practice. Training, clearly, it's obligatory, but regular training, I think, is hugely important at all levels of the business. Um, training nowadays is, is relatively cheap. It's online. Um, it can be done every six months, certainly every 12 months, I would say, for everybody. Um, and I think we have certainly found that the, um, although lawyers may be very busy um, and often feel that any sort of bureaucracy can be a chore, um, our admin and support staff are very, very good at keeping the lawyers in line and making sure that forms are completed and that assessments are done when they need to be done. All right then, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that uh, recording of the conference last week. Um, so in a moment, we'll start off with some live questions uh, from uh, myself, just to reintroduce the panel. Colette Best, Director of Anti-Money Laundry at the SRA, Mandeep Sandhu, Head of Practice Supervision at the SRA, and Michael Lane, Managing Partner at Gisby Harrison. Um, so just before we move into questions, we've had a few questions through about the lunchtime session, which I flagged at the start of my presentation. Um, we're not re-recording that and replaying that one during this uh, virtual compliance officers week. However, what we are doing is running a webinar on this topic, um, plus a webinar the week before, which will be a practical session on uh, firm-wide risk assessments. So firm-wide risk assessments followed by a practical webinar on client-to-matter risk assessments. Those will both be taking place in February in the new year. So we're shortly going to be posting details of that to our website so keep an eye on the SRA uh, events page and we'll be opening bookings for those shortly. So we've had uh, some really good questions through. I'm going to kick off with a question on source of funds, source and wealth because quite a lot of the questions on the day were about this. So the question we've had through is what uh, level of information should a firm be gathering on source of funds, source of wealth, as clients can often find this intrusive. Um, so why don't I ask Mandy to, to comment on that uh, in principle, and then Michael, perhaps you might just say a word or two about how you manage that from firm perspective. Thanks, Colette. 
Um, so the regulations stipulate that source of funds check should be carried out where necessary. Um, and one of the things I probably want to set out at the outset is, is it's one of the best protections for your firm um, in terms of finding out that you're not re receiving or accepting the policies of crime into your client account. Um, one of the things we say is you should consider uh, what you know about the client and matter when you're carrying out those source of funds checks and whether what the client tells you supports that position. Um, so we're not asking you to go on you know, a, fish, a fishing expedition and, and, and looking at every penny, um, but you still need to gather enough information to be fully confident that the funds that you're receiving um, are what you expect and what you know of the client and aren't the proceeds of crime. Um, so obtaining just a bank statement isn't enough um, because all that does is show you that the money exists. You should really find out how the uh, client came to accumulate those funds um, and there should be a documented uh, trail on, on your file to support that position. Um, and also relying on a UK bank account isn't enough either. Um, so, so you should be carrying out those check yourself. Um, and a client matter risk assessment is a good uh, tool uh, to inform your approach um, on that. Um. Thanks, Mandy. And how do you deal with this practically, Michael? Well, I, I think, as you, as you say, trying not to cause offence is hugely important. So I think you have to start by explaining to the client that it's a professional legal obligation and it's it's part of the process that you have no choice but to carry out. Um, and then the questions tend to be really in two stages, because firstly, it's asking the high level questions of can you just explain where the money is and can you explain what the source of, the, of your wealth or the source of the funds is, knowing that there's going to be a second level of questions depending on what the first answer is, because clearly if they say it's the sale of a property, then you'll be asking questions about the sale of that property and perhaps asking for documents to back it up. Um, if they say it's an inheritance or as a lot of clients simply say savings, um, then clearly one has to dig a little deeper uh, with most clients fairly gently and most people are fairly happy, um, particularly if it's at an early stage. I think carrying out the investigations at an early stage of the transaction is always far less contentious than asking the questions just before exchange of contracts. That's what tends to cause the problems. Um, uh, and in terms of offence, I think experience shows that if you ask the questions nicely and explain, if a, if somebody then purports to be offended, to me that's often a red flag as to why they don't want to disclose the information to you. So I think handled correctly it shouldn't be a problem. Super, thanks Michael. And I think some really handy uh, practical tips there on, on making sure that you are doing client due diligence early for a number of reasons. So it can make declining a client so much easier if you've, you've not onboarded them. Uh, it's so much easier not having to return funds if you've gone through those checks ahead of receiving funds. So uh, a couple of really ha handy practical tips there. Um, so we're still getting quite a few questions in, but we've got time for a few more. So don't forget to get your questions in if there are things you'd like to put to the panel. Um, so let's move on now to a question about sanctions. Uh, no name against this one, um, but uh, Mandy, perhaps you can, can comment on this one. Are you able to give any practical advice regarding financial sanctions checks in lower risk areas such as personal injury? So what, what would be your response to that, Mandy? Yeah, so the, the sanctions regime is one of strict liability uh, and not a risk based approach. And um, so it really depends on um, your firm's appetite to risk and, and how much risk you're willing to bear. Uh, you should always document the approach that you have taken and why you haven't carried out a search if that's the method you're choosing. Um, but one of the things we do encourage is to use Office's fuzzy tool where you can put in the client's name into um, the system just to check. It's, it's a free tool to see if that person is, is designated and that's quite um, an easy search to carry out. Um, the other thing to set out is, is there's no reliance so, uh, it, with, with the sanctions regime, so you can't rely on the fact that those checks would have been carried out but by another party. Um, but obviously have issued guidance um, on counterparty risk and the extent of checks um, and, and whether they, how they should be appropriate to the degree of risk. So I'd really encourage you to read Office's um, enforcement guidance on that area too. Super, thanks Mandy. Uh, and we've also, uh, as the SRA, published quite a lot of guidance plus some Q&A on this, so do check that out on our website. So uh, moving on again, another question here with no name against it. Can all the costs of ID checks linked to a transaction matter be charged to the client? 
Um, so why don't I pick that up? So actually, yes, you can pass on your costs of uh, customer due diligence to your client. That was a change that we made back in, I think, 2019 or so uh, to clarify that actually you can pass on costs of customer due diligence to your client, um, providing it's reasonable uh, and that's absolutely clear to the client at the outset. So those are the, the two points to bear in mind that it does need to be reasonable, the costs that you're passing on. Um, so let's move on to uh, some more questions. Um, so someone's put their name against us, and this is from Alex. So how often would you recommend we do updated DBS checks on our own employees? So I think this is referring to uh, employee screening, which is uh, linked to, to size and nature of the firm. Um, so perhaps, Mandeep, if, if you uh, sort of speak about your thoughts on that, and then, uh, Michael, you might uh, just share what you do on employee screening. Sure. Well, yep. Yeah. So, so Regulation 21 sets out um, the screening requirements and they are dependent on, on size and nature. So how often you want to run those checks is really down to, to your firm's um, firm and its size. Um, but there are various other tools that you can you can use to screen um, uh, your, your employees. Um, and some of those are, for example, uh, I think the main thing is, is what the requirements ask you to do is check um, for conduct and integrity and the knowledge, skills and experience of your employees and, and some of the mechanisms we recommend in guidance is having regular one to ones to check knowledge, skills and experience. Um, also declarations um, are, are a useful tool. Um, uh, searching the solicitors register for any findings um, and also um, carrying out other checks such as um, end of year reviews to make sure um, uh, pe people are working in accordance with the skills and knowledge um, and file reviews also account for that as well. So there's a combination of tools you can use for screening and if you are a firm that use DBS checks and you can take a risk based approach as to how often you want to rerun those if, if you have got other mechanisms in place. Super. Thanks, Mandy. And Michael, how do you go about this in practice? Because it can be quite challenging to, to decide sort of what levels of checks you need to be doing on, on different employees. So how do you find this? Predominantly our checks are done at the outset. And we've, we're fortunate that we don't have a high turnover of staff. Mm. Um, so we do get to know, to be, know people. But certainly at the outset, clearly we take up references. Um, hugely important to do that, often on the telephone, often looking for gaps on CVs, etc. Um, and nowadays there's a lot of simple online checks one can do with Googling, LinkedIn, the SRA, the Law Society and the like. Again, would never employ anybody without doing those, it would be madness. Um, uh, and then obviously you keep, keep up to date with annual reviews and the like. Um, uh, DBS checks have to be done, of course, regularly for uh, conveyance and quality scheme purposes. Um, I, I, I really don't see the point in updating those too regularly, but every few years they're done. And, and I think that's personally enough. Super. Thanks, Michael. And I think I agree. I mean, Google is is such a great tool. So uh, just running staff through Google on a regular basis. Another tip that we've seen is firms saying where they've got customer due diligence software that does, you know, um, adverse media checks. You can use that to, to screen staff as well, as long as that's that's clear that it's used in that way. So that might be a, another sort of uh, practical way of, of, of helping to do employee screening. So let's move on to another question. Um, so this one is from Pam. So Pam says, we are a purely employment law firm, but we are considered tax advisors due to settlement agreements. Are we in scope of the AML regulations? Um, so why don't I pick up on that one? So yes, when the definition of tax advisors changed a few years back, that did bring quite a few firms into scope. Uh, that hadn't previously been in scope, particularly in the area of, of employment law. Um, so unfortunately, the, there's no de minimis in the money laundering regulations. You're, you're either in or you're out. So if you're doing any tax advice work, that does mean that your firm is in scope for the regulations. And then the full force of the regulations come to bear. So you need to be making sure that you're meeting all of your requirements to uh, do the various risk assessments we've spoken about at various levels, you have policies, procedures and controls, do, do training. Um, 
However, in your case, uh, Pam, what you might decide is quite a lot of your work is reasonably low risk. Um, and you would probably want to set that out in your firm wide risk assessment. Uh, and that could be reflected in your your client matter risk assessments. So I hope I hope that's helpful. Um, there's quite a few questions along these same lines about firms doing work in and outside of scope of the regulations. Um, so I've got a question here, which again, uh, Mandy, I might come to you for, for sort of in principle and then uh, come to Michael. Um, so do firms only doing work outside of scope of the AML regulations need to consider doing practice wide risk assessments? Um, so perhaps Mandeep, if you might want to comment on on sort of some of the practica uh, the uh, requirements there. Um, and Michael, I know your firm does work uh, both in and out of the scope of the regulations, so it might be useful for people to sort of hear practically how you you treat work that's outside of scope, uh, even though your firm is is doing mixed mixed work. So, uh, Mandy, what's what's your feeling on that one? Yeah, so the requirement to carry out a firm wide um, risk assessment is is for firms that are in scope of the money laundering regulations. But in our sanctions guidance, uh, we, we considered it good practice to carry out a practice wide uh, risk assessment, even if you aren't in scope of the regulations, just to consider your sanctions risk and exposure. Um, and, and we think it's a really good tool um, to, to mitigate risk. And, and some of the things you might want to consider for out of scope work um, is is things like do you access or deliver services that are um, quite high risk for sanctions or so trade, um, immigration work, aviation, shipping? Do you have clients um, subject to or, or from countries that are subject to sanctions? So, so these are all things that you might want to consider in a practice wide risk assessment, whether you're in scope or not. So we do think and we encourage it as good practice to have um, a practice wide risk assessment, uh, irrespective of whether you're in scope or not. The other thing which is quite um, useful is um, uh, those areas where work moves from out of scope to in scope. So, so you might be dealing with um, a matter where there's a property element that's eventually involved and then you, that mo work then moves into in scope and that it's good to cover passporting risk in, in, in your firm wide risk assessment and what your firm's approach is for that. And I'll probably bring Michael in now to speak to how, how his firm deal with it. Well, because we're a general practice and we've, we have about 50% of our work that's in scope and 50% that's not. Um, uh, and we also have quite a lot of our lawyers who will sometimes themselves be working in scope or out of scope, particularly, if, for example, in the private client team. We just found it was so much easier to operate if we just treat everything as being in scope. And that way it is also much easier then to build a culture of dealing with compliance because everybody knows it has to be dealt with every time um, and it just becomes part of the routine. If if you have to sit down each and every time and decide whether this is in scope or not in scope or might be or might not be, it, it just becomes it's another thing to think about that you really don't need in the course of a busy working day. Just set up the systems so that everything is treated as being in scope. Super, thanks, Michael. Uh, so a couple of people are commenting that Mandy has mentioned the sanctions checking tool that, that Offsea provide, which is free. Um, we're going to be pasting that link in the chat. It's also in our guidance. Um, but also if you Google Offsea consolidated list search, uh, you can you can find that via Google as well. But it is a, a really good and a really useful tool for, for sanctions checks. And as Mandeep says, it, it is free as well, which is, of course, a bonus. Um, so uh, let's move on to some other questions. Um, so a few themes begin to emerge here. Um, source of funds checks again. So question here, do I need to do source of funds checks on money coming from another SRA regulated firm or can we ask for them to confirm that they've done it? So I think the answer to this one is going to depend on whether you've got a formal reliance agreement in place with that firm. So you can rely on another regulated firm's customer due diligence, providing you have agreed with them in writing and they've consented to being relied upon. Um, if that is not in place, then no, you need to be doing your own source of funds checks. Um, is there anything that you want to add to that? Mandeep on reliance. We don't see it being used very often in, in practice. 
We don't see used often in practice. <clears throat> the responsibility still rests with the firm, even if there is a, a reliance arrangement in place. Um, but uh, you would need that in place to, to accept um, that those checks have been done. Super. And Michael, do you use reliance in your firm? I know a lot of firms are very hesitant to use it because of the uh, the liability issues. And no, it's a simple answer. Why? Why would we? Super. Well, um, just to flag that there are uh, we are expecting a consultation on the new money laundering regulations out probably later this year. Uh, the the difficulty of using reliance is something that, that I anticipate will be in our consultation response. That might be something that, that others want to, to comment on uh, if you're also submitting responses to that consultation in due course. So, uh, OK, let's move on to another question. Um, so this one's from Helen uh, and I'm, I'm happy to pick this one up. So um, if the only funds that the firm is receiving is payment for professional fees, how detailed must the source of funds investigations be? Um, and actually, Natasha has also asked that question. So that that's uh, quite a popular question. Um, so actually, uh, case law and proceeds of crime act state that uh, payment for professional fees is not required to, to have money laundering checks against it. So you don't need to be doing source of fund checks on payment for professional fees. Um, what we have done, however, is published some guidance on complying with the Proceeds of Crime Act, um, which is particularly useful if you're out of scope of the money laundering regulations. If you're in scope of the money laundering regulations, what you're probably doing uh, is probably a lot of the things that are already um, set out in that guidance anyway. Um, but what we have done is publish some more information for firms outside of scope of the regs to talk about how you can make sure that your firm is is not being used for, for laundering money. So that might be a useful one to, to take a look at. All right, um, so uh, let's move on to another question. So this one is from uh, Nicola. She says, is there a difference? Uh, is there a difference to money laundering requirements if you do not have a client account and do not hold client money at all? So I think that's that's a really good question. Um, and quite often we get questions from people saying, I don't hold client money, therefore I must not be in scope of the money laundering regulations. So I think it's really important to be clear that it's the activities that you're offering, the services that you're offering that may or may not bring you into scope of the money laundering regulations. Um, whether or not you hold a client account is, is not, not a factor in that. Um, in terms of the requirements, so no, there probably isn't a difference in the money laundering requirements if you're not operating a client account. Um, it might be that perhaps the type of work that you're doing is lower risk if perhaps you're not doing conveyancing um, and you would want to set that out in your firm wide risk assess assessment and reflect that in your client matter risk assessments. Um, but that's contingent on the actual work that you're doing itself, not whether or not you're operating a, a client account. Um, so let's let's move on. We've got time for maybe maybe one or two final questions before we need to think about wrapping up uh, at 11.30. Um, so, uh, Mandeep, I might come to you on this one, another one on source of funds. So this one is from Roberto about uh, gifted gifted monies. Um, so how far do you go in? to source of funds and source of wealth where there is uh, a nomin where there is uh, parents or grandparents gifting money to children to purchase a property. Um, so you will also want to check what your obligations are if you're acting on behalf of a mortgage lender. Quite a lot of mortgage lenders set out requirements to do checks on uh, gifted deposits. Um, but in terms of the money laundering regulations, Mandy, what would be your advice in that situation? We would uh, recommend that you document um, uh, uh, where the funds are coming from. We, we do see see quite a lot of evidence sometimes from, from gifted deposits when we carry out inspections, which is quite good practice. I think the key thing to firstly set out um, is source of funds is how um, that how the, the funds for that particular matter um, have been accumulated. Um, so the 50,000 deposit, for example, where a source of wealth is an overall arching picture 
um, of the client's full wealth. Um, and source of wealth checks are uh, necessary for enhanced due diligence matters and um, for, for politically exposed persons. Um, but your client and matter risk assessment is a really good tool to inform your approach to the level of due diligence and checks you need. So if it makes sense for the parents and grandparents to have um, that level of money in to give that deposit, then that should be documented within that. And then you can take a risk based approach, approach as to finding out where that money came from. Often we'll see um, a pension a statement sometimes on files, uh, which is quite, quite a good tool to, to show that the, the money's come from there. Um, I don't know, Michael, you want to comment in practice in terms of how you deal with gifted deposits? Well, I, 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 I think the answer to all these questions is you've got to ask questions that are reasonable to make sure that you are reasonably satisfied as to the source of funds. Um, and yes, gifted deposits are now very frequently received from parents or grandparents. Um, and sometimes the answer to the questions give you a very, very simple explanation. Um, you know that the parents are wealthy, they're in business, they can produce evidence of, of their source of funds easy. Um, uh, but I agree, sometimes they can't. But you, it's, yeah, you, you can't specify what questions you have to ask. You just have to ask the right questions. And every single case is, of course, different. And actually, uh, that, that probably answers another question that, that's just come in on this topic from Eddie, who asks where you can't get source of funds info. Um, should we refuse to do the work or is it OK to say we've done all we can and accept the risk? My feeling would be that, no, if you're not happy with source of funds, you shouldn't be acting in that instance. Um, Simon's flagged that we've got quite a few questions still coming in, so we'll, we'll maybe just overrun a little bit uh, with a couple of more because there's a couple that, that we've not gotten to yet. Um, and one of those which hasn't come up yet is about independent audits. Uh, again, no, no name against this one, but it says regarding independent audits on AML for a small firm, do we need an external audit or can you do it in house? Um, so I might might come over to you on this one, Mandy, but the requirement to have uh, independent audit is based on the size and nature of your firm. So you could be a small firm doing very high risk work. And in that case, we would still consider that you, you do need to do an independent audit. Um, but Mandy, what, what would be your advice for firms on, on seeking independent audit? Yeah, <clears throat> so the independent audits don't need to be external. You, you can carry out internal um, uh, independent audits, but the individual carrying that audit out needs to be sufficiently independent from the MLRO and anyone who's drafted the firm's policies or firm, firm wide risk assessment shouldn't be providing input into that. So as long as the individual's um, sufficiently independent, they can carry out an internal audit. Um, but the main thing is, and often we see this with both external and internal audits, is that it, the audit still needs to meet the requirements of the regulations. Um, so often we'll find that file reviews have been conducted, but the underlying procedures like the policies, controls, the firm wide risk ass assessment haven't been reviewed, or, or we'll see the opposite where the, the firm wide risk assessment and policy has been reviewed, but there's been no um, file analysis. Um, so the audit needs to assess the adequacy and effectiveness of your firm's controls and procedures. Um, and so as long as it covers those areas in Regulation 21, um, that, that audit should be sh um, sufficient. Super, thanks, Mandy. And the other question we get quite often about independent audit is, is how often should I have it done? Um, and again, this is a, another it depends answer. Um, so you're probably going to be wanting to do independent audits more frequently where you've had significant changes. So that could be uh, a legislative change. It could be a change to your processes, change to your policies, change in staff. Um, again, if you've had an audit that, that you've sort of passed with flying colours, you might want to think about doing your next one less frequently than if your audit uh, brought back quite a lot of issues that, that you needed to rectify. Um, so a few more questions coming in. Um, we'll, we'll, maybe, we'll maybe just overrun by sort of five, ten minutes just to try and get through these. Um, so a question with no name against it, are freelancers in scope? Uh, the answer to that is yes, uh, freelancers absolutely can be in scope. Again, it goes back to the, the services that you're offering. So irrespective of the, the sort of whether you're acting as a freelancer or the structure of your business, 
uh, you will be in scope if you're doing any of the activities set out in the money laundering regulations. So, for example, conveyancing, trust and company service work, tax advice. Uh, so even if you are a freelancer, you need to make sure that you've registered with us or with another supervisor for AML supervision uh, and that you're complying with all the, the requirements and the regulations. All right. Um, just looking through some of the, the questions coming through. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, be interested to hear, Michael, if this is something that, that you find. This is a question from Sarah who says, we find FCA companies are not prepared to provide ID due to, due to being highly regulated and therefore we cannot carry out ID searches, what should we do? So if you've got a, another company that is regulated uh, as your client itself, rather than an introducer, you can look at doing simplified due diligence. And if it's a very big company, you need to be checking to make sure that the person that you're dealing with has got authority to act uh, for that company. But is this something that, that you see in, in practice? No, absolutely. I've never, never come across that. Never had any resistance at all. So um, it may be particular issues with a particular company. Interesting. OK, and I guess the other question is why? Why is the firm reluctant to provide ID? And is that something that, that you find suspicious? Uh, and if so, you know, you can still think about submitting a, a suspicious activity report, uh, which is something that, that Mandeep has also flagged in, in our chat about uh, if you can't complete source of funds checks, that you might also want to submit uh, an information suspicious activity report if, if you do have a suspicion of money laundering. All right, um, so we've got time for, for maybe one last question uh, and then we'll think about wrapping up. So this final question is, as a new startup, at what point would you need to put in place a firm-wide risk assessment? Um, for example, we might not know the nature of the client base to start with. So I think you will need to have something in place before you start offering services. But if you're a new startup, then that is going to be something that you're going to be having to update, kept updated quite frequently. And as your client base and your services change, making sure that, that you're updating your firm wide risk assessment fairly frequently. Um, is there anything that, that you want to add, Mandy, for uh, firm wide risk assessments for, for new practices? I think at the earliest um, opportunity is 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 the best best method, as as Colette suggested. We do have guidance for new money laundering compliance officers and reporting officers, um, which sets out day one, day seven, which is a useful guidance to to look at on our website. Um, so so that might inform your approach in terms of when to implement what and and, and what um what how to start with your new firm. Great point. Thanks, Mandy. All right. I think what we're going to do is is wrap up there because we've we've overrun by uh, sort of five ten minutes. So um, all that remains is for me to to thank our speakers, Mandeep and Michael. It's been great having you with us again today. Um, thanks ever so much for tuning in. If we didn't get to your question, we'll uh, take a look and see whether there's any themes that we can pick up in future webinars. But apologies if if we didn't get to you. And if you have a, a specific question, of course, you can give our ethics helpline a call uh, and they can offer support for, for individual questions. Um, so I think it's, it's been a really good session, uh, but we do want to know what you think. So did this format work for you? Is it something you'd want to watch in, in future years? Are there ways that we can improve it? Um, there should be a feedback link uh, below your screen. So please do click on that and let us know your views. Um, there are further sessions being shown this week from the compliance conference. The next one is going to be transparency rules, helping customers make informed decisions. And that's going to be happening at 12.15. Uh, and as I said earlier, we are going to be doing a couple of practical sessions on assessing risk. So one on firm wide risk assessments, one on climate matter risk assessments in February. So keep an eye on our website. And we'll be advertising that shortly. So all that is left for me to say is thank you very much for, for tuning in. Thanks again to our panellists and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.